Someone who is a labour man, and I mentioned real labour. This man personifies what real labour really is. Somebody who was there right from the very start. Uh, the patron saint of labour for independence, I would say. <laughs> It's been an absolute privilege for the past two years to campaign with this man. He is the uh, chairman of the Yes Advisory Board. Please welcome Dennis Canvin. Uh, thank you, Alan, for your kind words of introduction, and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak at this great, well-attended meeting uh, here. Uh, in Dundee uh, this evening. It's been a very exciting day, hasn't it? We had three distinguished day trippers coming all the way from Westminster up to Scotland to tell us we've never had it so good. <laughs> eh? By heavens, eh? the best of both worlds were better together. Who are they kidding? Eh? They remind me eh? Three wee ornaments that used to sit in my old granny's mantelpiece. Three wee monkeys. <laughs> Hear no evil, see no evil, and speak no evil. Well, they may not have heard, seen, or spoken evil, but they certainly perpetrated a lot of evil on the people of Scotland and elsewhere uh, in this united uh, kingdom. Here we are again. Scotland is being ruled. Uh, by a government, a, a Tory-led coalition government, which we did not elect. They've got a magnificent total, that lead party in that coalition. They have a magnificent total of one. One out of 59 parliamentary constituencies in the whole of Scotland. And yet, under the great British constitution, that one seat is sufficient mandate for them to impose upon us policies which we did not vote for and policies uh, which we did not want. And of course, what do they do with the power that they've got? They're rewarding the rich with massive tax handouts, punishing the poor with savage cuts in their benefits, including the imposition of the iniquitous bedroom tax. And as a result, we've got what? One in four children in Scotland living in poverty. Uh, over 70,000 in Scotland alone dependent upon uh, food banks. And in the UK as a whole, uh, we have the ignominy of being the fourth most unequal country in the whole of the developed world. And they tell us that we're better together. <laughs> uh, the best of both worlds. I mean, what, what planet? are these people uh, living on. It's a little wonder that people are crying out for change and yet when you look at Westminster what opportunity for change is there? I mean the, the coalition have made it quite clear that they're going to uh, continue their brand of austerity and when we look at the third partner uh, in the coalition because that's what it is now you know it's, a, it's, it's almost like a, a coalition of, of three parties that we've got to fight to win this uh, uh, referendum. And when you look at the, the so-called leader of Her Majesty's opposition, well, I turn on the box now and again to see what's going on at Westminster, and I look not just at the government benches, but I look at the green benches opposite, wh which I spent uh, most of my time when I was at uh, Westminster, and I see the leader of the opposition with very little of any commitment. I mean, it took him over a year to come out with a rather half-hearted commitment uh, to abolish uh, the bedroom tax. Uh, and uh, what is he saying now? What is his... Right? I heard him this morning, I know it's gone about social justice. His recipe for social justice seems to be to continue the Tory benefit cap, uh, to cut further uh, the welfare for unemployed young people and when he says that he cannot afford to do otherwise he tells us that he's intent on spending billions of pounds of taxpayers money on weapons of war and mass destruction
So I have come to the conclusion that changing the occupancy of 10 Downing Street is not going to bring about the radical change which the majority of the people of Scotland uh, want to see. I have no faith whatsoever in the constitutional status quo. I don't see independence as being a panacea, but I think it's an opportunity, a massive opportunity for people of my age group, a once in a lifetime opportunity to bring about the change which the majority of people of Scotland uh, want to see. Now, I'm a convert to the cause of, uh, of independence, and my conversion is not born out of any great emotional experience. Uh, it came mainly from my lifetime ex experience, particularly my parliamentary experience. I spent 26 years at Westminster as a Labour MP, followed by eight years as an independent member of the Scottish Parliament. I've been retired now for seven years, and as some of you may know, retirement gives you time to think, time to reflect. And after a great deal of thinking and reflection, I have come to the conclusion that Westminster is completely out of touch with the people of Scotland. <laughs> what about the Scottish Parliament? Well, it's not perfect. It's made up of human beings, and human beings of the very nature make mistakes. But by and large, I think, over the 15 years of its existence, the Scottish Parliament has shown that it tries to respond far more readily and far more positively to the values, the wishes, the needs and the aspirations of the people of Scotland. And let me just give two or three examples just to substantiate that statement. Uh, higher education in Scotland uh, is free, whereas students out of the border are now having to pay uh, £9,000 per year uh, in tuition fees. Uh, care in the community. Uh, if people require a care package, particularly elderly people requiring a, a degree of care, the personal element of that care and the nursing ele element of that care is free of charge, whereas people have to pay for it south of the border. And we still have in Scotland a National Health Service, which was, yes, founded on the principles of Nye Bevan, but we have tried to stick to those principles by ensuring that our National Health Service remains the property of the people and freely accessible to the people uh, at the time of need. So the Scottish Parliament has, to my mind, uh, delivered higher standards of social justice uh, for the people of Scotland compared with what our friends south of the border uh, have to suffer. However, the powers of the Scottish Parliament are very limited. Most of the big political and most of the big economic decisions uh, are taken uh, at Westminster. So I say to myself, and I say to you, that if the Scottish Parliament had the full powers of independence, then it would be able to do so much more to improve things for the people of Scotland. If, for example, we had powers over foreign affairs and defence, we'd be able to stop our involvement in illegal warfare. <laughs> and stop spending billions uh, of pounds uh, on Trident and other weapons uh, of war and mass destruction. If we had uh, the powers to regulate the financial institutions, we'd be able to stop the bankers filling their pockets with big fat bonuses while bringing the country virtually to the brink of economic disaster. And <laughs> and if the Scottish Parliament had full powers over taxation and the national insurance, we'd be able to introduce a far fairer, more progressive system of taxation, whereby the rich pay a bit more, the poor pay a bit less, and the very poor shouldn't be paying any tax at all. And if we had a fair system uh, of welfare too, then we'd be able to uh, abolish that iniquitous bedroom tax, which would never, never have seen the light of day in an independent Scotland. So, I see independence not as an end in itself, but as a means towards building a better Scotland, a more prosperous Scotland, but above all a fairer Scotland, and a Scotland that will play its full part in the international community. Before I finish, just a wee word about Yes Scotland, because I chair the 
advisory board of that organisation. Uh, and uh, it is a, 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 broad, a broad kirk, as, as some people might uh, describe it. We are a very comprehensive, inclusive organisation consisting of people from various political backgrounds, various political parties, and people like myself who are not members of any uh, political party. Uh, it's difficult getting that message across sometimes because uh, uh, some people allege that we are just a front uh, for the SNP uh, and a lot of Labour people seem, in particular seem to be under that misapprehension. Indeed I came across a constituent, a former constituent fairly recently uh, and uh, uh, she's a great supporter of mine and uh, but she was like myself uh, uh, originally, originally Labour born and bred and I said to her well, Janet, will you be voting yes in the referendum? She said, oh, I don't know about that, Dennis. She says, I, I voted for you when you became independent, she says, and I can understand that, but oh, no, no, son, this is a, this is a step too far. Surely you're not asking me to vote for that man, Salmond. Surely you're not asking me to vote for the SNP, my father would kill me. I said, look, Janet, for a start, your fear has been deep for 20 years or more. <laughs> and uh, secondly, I'm not asking you in this referendum to vote for any particular political party or any particular politician. That this is a matter which transcends uh, party politics. I am asking you to vote yes in this referendum to build a better future for Scotland, for you, for your children, and for your grandchildren. Can we win? Well, I remember when we launched this uh, campaign, I remember Brian, it was just over two years ago when we launched the campaign at some big cinema uh, in Edinburgh, and there were uh, a lot of the opposition at that time, and a lot of the, the political pundits and posters said, oh, that made chance. You know, at one point, they were 20 points ahead. They didn't even think they had to mount uh, much uh, of a campaign. Well, I said at that time, that this campaign is going to be a long campaign, it's going to be more like a marathon than a short sprint and having run a more than a few marathons in my time I know that sometimes you can be behind uh, but uh, maybe even at the halfway point you're still struggling uh, but we're coming into the home straight now and I'll tell you this, we are not just narrowing the gap we are neck and neck. Indeed, one of the polls recently showed that we are slightly ahead. But for heaven's sake, don't let's get complacent. We have a huge, a huge amount of work to do in the next eight days. And make no mistake about it, uh, what we saw earlier today from the three Westminster leaders is nothing compared with the barrage of propaganda that we are going to see within the next uh, week or so. And we are going to be up against the whole powers of the British establishment. We are going to be up against uh, the media too. And I know that some people get a bit disconsolate when they say, oh dear, we didn't get a fair deal there. And uh, the, the media, again, this, this newspaper and says this and they're telling lies. Now I'll tell you this, this campaign is not simply going to be fought and won in TV studios or radio studios or the column inches of newspapers. This campaign is going to be fought and it's going to be won in the communities of Scotland. And we have an army of foot soldiers who are capable of taking our message out to every city, every town, every village, every hamlet, every shopping centre, every school, every university, every workplace in Scotland. We are going to win the hearts and minds of the people of Scotland with a positive message. And our positive simple message is this, that it is only by voting yes in this referendum that you, the people of Scotland, are going to be empowered, empowered to build 
a better Scotland, yes, a more prosperous Scotland, but a fairer Scotland, and a Scotland that will play its full part in the international community to help to build a better world. That is our message. And when we succeed in getting that message across to the people of Scotland, we shall win a famous and historic victory. So I say to the people of Dundee, let's go for it! Thank <laughs> you.